If you're looking for a place to go and find some trophies, this is the place to be in the charge of no fees. If you're on Xbox and need some game to score, come over here, I'll help you get some more. My name is Ken Zedretro, the host of the show, gaming news and reviews and all you need to know. Because the weekend is finally here at last, sit back, relax, enjoy the Trophy Achievement Podcast. Ah, oh, weekend's here. Sun's out, weather's good, which means we're in for another good day. Hello, my fellow Latter-day Saints, Kenzie Retro, the Mormon entertainer here, the most inspirational Mormon in all of Ayrshire. We're back once again with another edition of the Trophy Achievement Podcast, your one-stop shop for all your latest gaming news, rumours, and of course, those sweet points and trophies. That is, um, so I'm just getting a couple of things updated here, and there we go, preferences updated, that's fine. Right, so anyway, we've got a, we've got a fair chunk of news to get through uh, uh, this week, um, including, including, um, Fireteam Raven arcade game announced for Halo. Interesting. We'll have details of that. Um, no Man's Sky getting co-op multiplayer in July. Uh, E3 news as well. The full press conference schedule has been released. We will get details of that. And we have uh, a shiny Charizard for family in, in in excitement for the Pokemon Go Community Day uh, tomorrow at time of recording. Uh, the latest news on the Halo 6 and what's going to happen with that. No God of War DLC planned. We'll find out about that. YouTube's algorithm causing havoc for gaming live streamers. Gee, I wonder why. Skull and Bones, uh, the Ubisoft pirate game, it's uh, been delayed. Goodness, everything's getting delayed these days. Uh, but on a brighter note, Xbox's new X, but Microsoft's new Xbox controller, I should say, is designed for players with disabilities, which I think is fantastic. We'll get full details on that. Meet, meet yourself, Roadrunner! And... Fallout 3 Anniversary Edition has been leaked, and it could be coming to PlayStation 4. Who knows? Well, maybe we'll find out about that in uh, Bethesda's conference. Uh, GTA 5 hits hit a new sales record. Well, they've already hit new. They've already had um, new sales records, uh, but those sales records are just getting even bigger. And uh, what we have just found out. Uh, is yesterday there is a new so there was an there's an there is an addition to the Soul Calibur 6 roster and we're gonna find out about that addition later on in the show and in the points and trophies section in honor of state of decay blah can't remember what's that in honor of state in decay no in honor of state of decay 2 coming out on Tuesday I'm going to be going through the secret achievements. There's only four of them, though, but uh, they are going. Uh, they uh, the secret achievements for the first state of decay. I've gone for the year one survival edition, as that's obviously got more trophies. But nevertheless, that is all coming up on this week's edition of the Trophy Achievement Podcast. Uh, what you what you can also do uh, you can um, uh, so if you if you enjoy what you if you enjoy what you see here every week on the podcast you can hit the subscribe button and uh, click the bell to join the, lat- the latter day scenes notification squad. Turn on all notifications so you don't miss anything I do on this channel tomorrow. I've got more Tom and Jerry sins. It's Royal Wedding Day as well, uh, but as far as I'm concerned, I've got more important things to be concerned about, such as. I don't know, the FA Cup final between Chelsea and Manchester United. That's going to be a very tasty game that I'm looking forward to. Uh, what else is, um, what else have we got? Um, 
uh, like I said, uh, yesterday I did the finale of the main playthrough of Pac-Man World. Uh, that'll be uh, in, an in one of the annotations uh, at the end of the video. And, uh, uh, um, uh, Monday and Tuesday next week, it's going to be music covers, uh, but, uh, not just any music covers, they're going to be Ariana Grande songs, because it's been, uh, as of Tuesday at 10.31pm, it's going to mark exactly one year to the day since the uh, Manchester Arena attacks hit the country and lives were changed forever, 22 of them. Uh, 22 lives taken from us way before, way before that time. The youngest victim only being eight years old. Now, the reason I bring this up is because uh, those who know me well, I was there, I was at the arena, I was at the concert, I was caught up in that incident that night. And um, I'm heading down. I'm going back to Manchester. I was I was there for my um, 25th birthday uh, last month, but uh, I'm, I'm back down on Tuesday for the day to commemorate one year since the events that changed the lives of so many people forever. So, um, and, obviously, and obviously one of the songs is going to be One Last Time, but it's going to be like, an acoustic piano arrangement of the song. The support that I've had over the course of the last year has been incredible. I honestly couldn't be more thankful for it. Couldn't be more thankful for the support that I've had. But when incidents like this happen, it really does open your eyes and, in my case, not take life for granted because you just never know what's around the corner. So I take each day as it comes and we just take it from there. But anyway, it's, um, like I said, Tuesday, Tuesday's going to be a tough day. There's no sugar coating it. But at the end of the day, I'm a strong person and I'll get through the day because the city's going to be united. Well, Manchester will be a city united on Tuesday. And I won't be back up and I won't be back up here in Scotland until Wednesday morning. And instead of a reaction video, I'm gonna be giving my thoughts on I'm gonna be giving my thoughts on the day that I spent down in Manchester. I'll be keeping people updated on social media. You can follow me at um, you can follow me on uh, you can follow me on Twitter at uh, I don't even have my does help if I can actually remember my Twitter handle. Anyway, there we go. You can follow me. You can follow me on Twitter at Kenzie Mormon, because that's where I post all my uh, YouTube um, uh, updates, whether it's links to my video or my playlists. Uh, so you can follow me on there. Uh, you can also follow me on uh, Instagram at Kenzie the Mormon. As I, as I, I haven't got much on there at the moment, but uh, that's primarily for uh, um, updating people on my. Um, on what's happening on my channel, as far as, as, far as like major updates are concerned, anyway. Uh, uh, what else is there? Uh, I've also got a Patreon. A uh, link down, link will be down in the description. Um, it's um, it's got, I've got, I've got a great mission statement. Basically, anything, I, basically anything I'm, 
any patrons that make a contribution towards what I do here, a uh, portion of it is going to go towards um, the National Autistic Society, which is a charity that's very close to my heart. I actually ran for the, ch the charity uh, last year uh, for the Great Scottish Run, did the 10k, raised about £300 on the day, which I was pretty happy about. So, so I've got that. Uh, and uh, one last thing, uh, uh, Boomerang Rentals. Big shout out to those guys, packages start from as little as £3.99 a month. Sign up today, you get a 21 day free trial, 3 free game rentals and there are no late fees, you can keep the game as long as you like, you can 100% it, you can get the platinum, you can get 1000 gamer score or you can keep the game forever at a discounted price from the online store. Boomerangrentals.co.uk, the best place to rent your games. Let's all laugh at an industry that never learns anything, tee hee hee. Oh, goody, 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 gumdrops. This is possibly the biggest gaming screw-up of the week. I have been reporting on this for weeks now. I've been, I've been reporting on this for weeks. And I mean weeks. And oh my goodness me. We have just had... Like I said, the biggest gaming screw up actually happening. And it's regarding Activision and Black Ops 4. We, I was reporting on this for weeks and weeks and weeks. And now it has actually happened. Where do I even begin? So, what we're going to do is, what we're going to do is we're actually going to get, we're actually going to get this set up. Because, oh boy, this is going to end well. Now, why is it? Hang on a second. Something isn't quite adding up. I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure I had it on high performance. And it is on high performance, and yet, this, and yet the CPU rating is through the roof. Why is that? I don't know. Right. Anyway. Let's see what they've done. Tacom, recon requesting attack chopper pass. Starting team are clear to deploy. Going up, great. Check fire, check fire. Kill all of them. We all love Black Ops for its combat experience. But imagine if we took that gameplay experience you know and love, and we spun it on its head. We don't have to describe how Battle Royale works. These games are no secret. We play them too. But for us to even consider this kind of experience, it had to be unique and done in a way only Black Ops could do. A survival game with the best, most refined mechanics in the world our signature controls and gameplay systems, and the kind of fast-paced action that only Call of Duty can deliver. All in the biggest map we've ever made. And that is just the beginning. We're bringing to bear 10 years worth of Black Ops Universe features. Your favorite characters, your favorite weapons, iconic parts of your favorite maps. And we're putting them all in one place a crazy collision of fun and letting you navigate it with land, sea, and air vehicles. Something you haven't experienced before. This is something totally new. This is doing Battle Royale the Black Ops way. This is Blackout.
Need I say more? The biggest gaming screw up, not just of this week, but also of the year so far. I mean, I'm sorry, but something you've never... the only way Black Ops can. Yeah, by copy and paste. You do that with the multiplayer every year, and now you've done it with this Battle Royale mode. And you call it Blackout. Taking your, taking part of your favorite Call of Duty maps. It's, it's basically a copy and paste of PUBG and Fortnite, as only Black Ops, as only Black Ops can. And I'm sorry, ten years of experience. You are aware that the first game. The first Black Ops game came out in 2010, eight years ago. Not 10, because 2008 was World at War. I mean, you, you can just, you can just tell from the way I'm sitting, I am just not impressed. Because, we all knew, I've been reporting on it for weeks. You may as well consider this the final nail in Call of Duty's coffin. What I'm actually going to do now is I'm actually going to see what the numbers are on the reveal trailer. Let's see, oops, wrong switch. And you've got Call of Duty fanboys outnumbering the dislikes. I mean, it just, I mean, it only came out, only came out yesterday. How much for the, how much for the V-Bucks? I have no life, it's supply drops, B-Bucks, expensive AF, card points, it's expensive since Fortnite is free and everyone is complaining that Fortnite is better than PUBG because it, cause it's free, but if you decide, Yeah, no campaign F this. Call of Duty fanboys. RIP Fortnite and PUBG. Hmm. 
Reaper, here's a comment here from Adam Marshall. What happens to the players who just buy the Call of Duty games just to play the campaign? My response? The series dies. End of. Fanboy. Oh, this, this comment's good. So Activision's response to PUBG slash Fortnite is to create a giant mashup of ALREADY EXISTING MAPS! But the already existing parts in cast, by the way, so that's why I'm shouting it. Throw in... Throw in there some beloved characters, just to absolutely ruin them once and for all. And charge you $60 plus microtransactions and loot boxes for that. You've had a whole year... Wrong! They've had THREE YEARS! Not one! Not two! THREE! And this is the best they can come up with! Think about how to innovate franchise. And this is the best you could come up with? Kinda of pathetic, but then again... They do, they do this in line... Do this in... Do is this a uh, black? But then again, it do is it do is in line. Pro need to proofread. Hang on, what is he actually trying to say here? But then again, does it in line? Does it in line with what you have been delivering for the last seven years? Seven years. Du, 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 du. Modern Warfare 3. So, congratulations! You have once again proved all your haters right. Ker Ching! <laughs> this game should be called Call of Duty Battle Royale. Bullseye! Exactly! Oh! I mean... I think somebody responding to that comment saying Battle Royale takes up only one third of the game. That's like saying this game should be called Call of Duty Zombie Slash Multiplayer! To which I responded, Zack does have a valid point. Everyone will be playing the Battle Royale mode, AND THAT'S IT! In Blackout, Black Ops comes to life in one massive battle royale experience combining Black Ops signature combat and the bigger signature combat. Black Ops 3 had you making jetpack jumps! <laughs> and the biggest map in Call of Duty history. Basically a rehash of key, key areas of other maps. If they can't even innovate the Battle Royale mode, you know 
I mean, it's at a point where if you cannot even innovate a new mode, you know the series is dead. Players find favorite characters and battle through iconic settings from the Black Ops universe. It's a collision course bringing together the world of Black Ops in an all-out survival and elimination experience featuring weapons, equipment, land, sea, and air vehicles. RCXDs, traps, and even zombies in an experience that is uniquely Black Ops. Pfft. They're trying to brush. They're trying to brush off World of War as if it didn't even exist. <sighs> you know something? This is this is what I think should happen to the Call of Duty series now. Footage! What the fuck? <laughs> yep. Blown up. Left to die. And everyone say it with me now. Never be seen again! Unbelievable Activision. And the worst part about it... And the worst part about it... This pretty much confirms that there's going to be no single player. The reveal trailer, just there, that I just showed you guys. With me, no reaction whatsoever. It confirms. It's, just, it, it's, it's confirmed. It's confirmed. They're no longer. It, they're no longer interested in single player. They're no longer interested in single player. Brilliant. That is just unacceptable, Activision. Unacceptable. And I guarantee you there's, I guarantee you there's going to be at least one person, there's going to be at least one person in the comments going to be typing out, How dare you constantly hate on Activision and Call of Duty? <laughs> Shut up, you big crybabies! The fact that they claim they're trying to innovate, and I say that loosely, innovate, the Battle Royale mode, and they basically do another copy and paste. So, as Luke Owen would put it in his um, WrestleTalk News updates, it's a case of Control C, Control V, aha! Control C, Control V, aha! Okay. Yep. That's basically what it is, in a nutshell. You're, it's basically powder coming out of the teats that you're trying to milk Activision at this point. It's just powder coming out of the teats at this point. 
and yet they still continue to milk the franchise for all it's worth, or lack thereof in this case. Anyway, I better I better get going on to the next news um, article. Otherwise, I'm, otherwise I'm going to be here all day ranting about how how what's what I'm looking for. I'll be here all day rant, ranting and raving about how bad Activision have become. The last properly good Black uh, Call of Duty game. Was Modern Warfare 2. First Call of Duty game I played. Was the first one I completed. Not 100%. But I did complete the campaign on Veteran. Anyway. Activision. Take note. Your fans are tired of Call of Duty. Kill the series. Leave it to die. Never be seen again. <sighs> anyway. A Halo game has been... A Halo, a Halo arcade game has been announced. And it's Fire Team, and it's a Fire Team Raven arcade game, interestingly. Fire alongside Mas the Master Chief during the events of the original Halo campaign. Hmm, interesting. Now let's see what this involves. Microsoft and 343 Studios have announced Halo Fire Team Raven a new four-player cooperative arcade game in partnership with Raw Thrills and Player Mechanics. The Halo-themed sci-fi shooter drops players in the role of ODST soldiers on the surface of Alpha Halo during the events of Halo Combat Evolved, fighting alongside the Master Chief against both the Covenant and the Flood. The Covenant is built as a massive 11-foot cubed coin-operated machine housing a 130-inch 4K display and four turreted, four turret mounted, multi-purpose machine guns to shoot at enemy troops and land and air-based vehicles, including hunters, banshees, and scarabs. Additionally, you'll be able to scan a QRC code with your phone to connect your experience to Halo, way, to your Halo Waypoint profile and chase high scores with others. Arcade games are a wholly different challenge compared to console and PC gaming, said Kiki Wolfkill head of Halo Transmedia at 343 Studios. Are you sure it's not 343 Industries? Ah, oh, never mind. We've learned a tremendous amount as we worked with Raw Thrills to make this happen. The cabinets are coming first to select Dave and Buster's locations in the United States and Canada this summer before rolling out to more locations in the fall. Bring them to the UK! I'll more than happily try it out! Let's see. Uh, there's an update on Halo 6. What is happening? Halo has long been Microsoft's killer IP and one of those franchises that acts as an incentive for people to upgrade their existing Xbox console. The series has had its ups and downs over the years, especially with Halo 5 proving to be a major disappointment for anyone who is who has a stake in the single player campaign. Halo 6 will hopefully be a return to form and remind people why Halo has been so highly regarded in the past. The third installment of the Reclaimer Saga, Halo 6, will pick up after the conclusion of Halo 5 Guardians, which saw Cortana... Oh, spoiler alert, by the way, folks, if you haven't played Halo 5 yet. Mind you, why am I saying that? I haven't played it either. 
So Cortana and other created AI seized control. Whoa! Which saw Cortana and the other created AI seize control of the galaxy. Wow! The plot will likely feature Master Chief and his allies resisting the new regime and restore freedom and liberty to humans and aliens alike. Freedom, liberty, and justice for all! It's been developed by 343 Industries, the same people who developed Halo 4 and 5 after taking over the franchise from Bungie! Let's see, so we, then we really do not know much else beyond that. We don't know much else beyond that. Right. God of War DLC not planned, according to Corey Balrog, the creative director. God of War DLC is something we were expecting to see due to the sheer size and scale of the game. Unfortunately, this isn't the case. At least right now, anyway. God of War 4, God of War 4 developers have no plans to work on any DLC at this time. We question why there will be no God of War DLC. Cory Balrog stated that they've added everything they can into the game without holding back parts for future DLC. We wish more game developers followed suit. My point exactly. A bold move not many developers would make, but due to the popularity of God of War, it's not such a big feat to pull off. The game has been a great success even without DLC. God of War 4, God of War 4 DLC isn't out of the picture, of course. We will have to see where the developers want to take God of War next. Due to God of War 4's huge success, there are rumours of a God of War Netflix series. Actor Jason Momoa, who played as Drogo in the huge hit series Game of Thrones, says hell yeah to playing Kratos in the God of War TV series. He's also known as Aquaman in Justice League. Released on April 20th for the PlayStation 4, God of War 4 has proven to be a huge success with great reviews from across the board. God of War 4 has great cinematic scenes using one cut, using a one cut camera system to add depth and overall a great cinematic experience. If you are yet to grab God of War 4, you can pick up your game. You can pick up your game here for a lot less than the retail price. Hello. Now, how much are we talking? $75. Are you serious? And well, I've got this article up. why most this is why a lot of people go to patreon these days youtube's algorithm is causing havoc for gaming live streamers live streamers who rely on youtube to make a living are finding themselves increasingly in, imperiled by its unrelenting automated glare right Let's see. Jimmy Broadbent was working late at night on April 14th. 
when everything suddenly went dark. He is one of many people who professionally stream games on YouTube's live stream service. With over 86,000 subscribers and around 1,500 people watching him play motor racing simulations every day, the game of choice that went that night was the TT Isle of Man. Based on the famed motorcycle race, this wasn't Jimmy's ideal challenge. He often states that he isn't a motorbike guy, much preferring four wheels to two. Nonetheless, he did his best to pilot his virtual bike around the 61km circuit. After a few hours, Jimmy decided to show how these laps should be done, and how professional motorbike racers brave the Snaefell mountain circuit. He brought up a GoPro video of Michael Dunlop's 2016 lap record for the circuit, 16 minutes and 54 seconds. Then, just three minutes into the video, his stream died, leaving a placeholder screen and his fans bewildered. It turned out YouTube's algorithm had also been watching and terminated his stream automatically for using copyrighted content. Jimmy had been shut down. You idiots! Around 400 hours of video is uploaded to YouTube every minute. The scale of its platform means that manually enforcing copyright is impossible, especially when video is being broadcasted live. Therefore, to fulfill its legal obligations, YouTube turned to an algorithm solution. More like an algorith algorithmic inconvenience! Since 2007, it has used a system named Content ID to police copyright on its platform. Due to the safe harbour rule present in the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, while websites are not held responsible for what their users do, they still have to remove the offending content. Content ID works by, works by comparing a database of copyrighted video and audio to newly uploaded videos. If there is any copyrighted content, then one of the three different things can happen depending on the options of the copyright holders have chosen. It can merely track the video to see the kind, same kind of statistics that the uploader can, it can remove or place advertisements in, onto the video, thereby allowing them to make some money from the unauthorized usage or stop any money being made at all. Or it can simply block the video. This is separate from a full copyright strike, which is issued manually by a copyright owner and can result in the deletion of an account if the user reaches three total strikes. In the case of live streams, they are all actively scanned for third-party content. With YouTube warning the streamer if they are in danger of getting banned before they actually before they act before actually carrying out the penalty. Jimmy says he didn't receive this. Further proof that the copyright system is beyond broken! For streamers trying to make a living from the platform, a strike on their account is a disaster. The penalty is a flat 90-day streaming ban. Seriously! Issued at the same time as the strike. Are you serious? For people like Jimmy, this means that their ability to make a living is not controlled by themselves, all their paying fans, but rather a particularly unforgiving algorithmic boss that can deny them three months of pay for the slightest infraction of rules. Like I said, the system is broken! Jimmy didn't immediately know that he had been struck by Content ID. I only knew about the stream being cut due to the massive wave of comments that appeared in the live chat. He explained he didn't receive any notification at the time from YouTube explaining what had happened, further proof the system's broken, and only discovered he was banned by accident while he was poking around the stream's advanced option menus trying to reset it. This ban was bad news for Jimmy. He relies on the paid subscriptions and donations of his fans to make a living, as uploading videos, once fairly, once fairly lucrative, no longer functions as a livelihood for content creators, it's with the exception of very of the very largest channels. And they shut down the smaller channels for stuff like this. You punish the many for the actions of the few. You idiots! 
to try and appeal the ban, Jimmy contacted YouTube saying, saying that he, while he would accept the strike, he was not intending to steal anything and that it was unfair that he would get such a serious penalty for a first offence. He hoped that his 10 years of good behaviour on YouTube would count in his favour. I haven't had any copyright strikes. The guy at the other end of the support chat just wasn't interested. He effectively said, he, is, he effectively told me, sorry, deal with it. And then tried to get me to leave the conversation. Jimmy says this was my first ever offence of this nature and to be handed a punishment like that with no warning made me realise that YouTube aren't really bothered about smaller creators. Backs up my point! I can't help but feel if I had a larger channel I would have received a different response. Have you not heard of something called EQUAL TREATMENT YOU MORONS! Jimmy swapped over to his Twitch account so that he could discuss the situation with his audience. WWE Superstar headed to the Marvel Cinematic Universe. They've already got one in the form of Batista. Jimmy swapped over to his Twitch account so he could discuss the situation with his audience. He had left his channel page untouched for almost a year so he could cultivate his audience on YouTube, which he says is a better site for him and to be, for him to be on as he pursues his career goal by becoming of becoming a motor journalist. But one advantage Twitch does have is that is its treatment of copyright. Had Jimmy been streaming, streaming on Twitch from the start that night, the only penalty he would have had was having the recorded version of that night's stream muted. I've effectively, I've effectively had blah. I've effectively had my career ripped out of my hands, he told his audience at the time, also explaining how his hopes to save his streaming money to move house and attend fan events had also been ruined. You see what happens when you have... Oh. Keep it family friendly, keep it family friendly, keep it PG, keep it family friendly, keep it family friendly. You see what happens when you have ridiculous systems like this that don't work for anyone except the company! Faced with the end of my streaming career, I stayed up all night updating my Twitch channel and trying to prepare myself for the massive hit that the ban would have given me. I went between sobbing and trying to tell myself that I would get through this. Unacceptable, ghoul. Unacceptable. Although the ban was a shock, Jimmy's friends and viewers were quick to react. Another user passed him the email address of Duke Video, the rights holder of the video in question, after sending what he describes as an apologetic and groveling email to the company, Jimmy got a far better response than he expected. Having sent the email at 3 a.m. 3 a.m. Duke had lifted on, on April 15th. This was last month. Literally just last month. Duke had lifted the claim by 9.50 a.m. that morning, with his live stream reinstated and the recording of the offending stream deleted from the site. Jimmy could live stream once again, and his mercifully brief ordeal now over. Duke Video manages the official videos of the Isle of Man TT, owned, owned both by itself and other organisations such as the Isle of Man government. Lee Masterson, Duke's YouTube content manager, looks after the videos uploaded on the site and is responsible for dealing with numerous content ID claims and counterclaims that Duke receives. Duke is also a YouTube partner, meaning that it can make contact with a YouTube representative if it needs assistance. Masterson explains that Duke had not spoken to its representative for several years as the whole process was automated. According to Masterson, if Content ID finds any of Duke's material in an unlicensed but edited source, the video is flagged for manual review rather than a straight-up ban that would happen to a more obvious clone. 
He finds content ID to be very effective, but occasionally too effective. The system is not foolproof and often I have to release material which is similar to our copyrighted material, he says, given the example of that video game footage can sometimes look similar to its videos and fall foul of an overzealous content ID. He says that Duke is generally quick to re release a claim if it gets sent manually, but in the case of automatic claims, it relies on the user disputing it to draw to its attention. Which adds more stress to YouTubers like myself, which is not needed! Content ID has even turned... Content ID has even turned on Duke itself in the past. Masterson tells the story of a very frustrating time when the channel had been conducting its own livestream of a race event, where the organisers were playing music over loudspeakers before the event began. Did not ask for that. The music was flagged by Content ID and the stream was instantly shut down. Much as it had with Jimmy. The only way to get the stream going again was to not claim the content. Therefore, sending any potential revenue from the stream to the creator of the, to the, creator of the music and not Duke. Google, or YouTube specifically, didn't respond to Jimmy's case. Hardly surprising. They never respond to anything. It originally sent publicly available help articles to explain how their system worked. It later gave a statement explaining how Content ID helps copyright owners manage their rights. Through a very broken system. For all the concerns around how Content ID is making life difficult for YouTubers, right holder groups believe that the site is still too relaxed when it comes to enforcing copyright. No, it's being too ridiculous because the system is broken! The IFPI, which represents the global music industry, argues that there is a value gap when it comes to YouTube art when it comes to YouTube artists, it claims. Uh, when it comes to YouTube artists, it claims, are not being paid fairly for the plays of their music on the site. According to the according to the IFPI, Nearly five times as many listeners use video streams compared to audio streams, and while video streaming takes up over half the time users spend streaming, the estimated annual revenue for a YouTube user is less than a dollar. The estimated, estimated annual revenue for a YouTube user less than a dollar compared to the $20 per user per year from Spotify! That is ridiculous! YouTube's counter to this in the form of a report it commissioned of a report it commissioned from RBB Economics conclude that it provides substantial value to the music industry. It counts its counterclaims include that the include that the site still pays over one billion dollars a year to the music industry from advertising revenue that the majority of music is uploaded onto partnered channels owned by the music publishers themselves, and that its recommendation algorithm is invaluable for users to discover new songs, especially if they haven't been released recently. What this means for streamers is that YouTube has little room to maneuver when it comes to changing content ID for their benefit. To do so would risk damaging the site's relations with copyright holders. They've already done that with a broken system! And perhaps more crucially, it would be bad news for YouTube's profits. Good! Damn well deserves it! And since its rivals can't compete with its prevalence, streamers have little choice but to continue nervously side-eyeing their algorithmic overlord. <sighs> and that leaves them in a precarious position. If YouTube switches you off, that's the closure of your business in the way that it could never be in the offline world says Phil Sherrill, partner and head of media, entertainment and sports at, at international law firm Bird & Bird. They're in a position of quite substantial commercial power. Sherrill compares the relationship to how Google is often left on its own to deal with right, with right to be forgotten requests. <sighs> right to be forgotten, goodness sake. With little interference from the courts. One of the interesting and controversial issues with big platforms is the extent to which they become 
mediator or arbitrator of some really complex issues that they don't solve in any way. It's a good example of the de facto concentration of power in platforms having unexpected consequences. Unexplained more like, but more than a decade after introduced content ID, it's becoming increasingly obvious that YouTube has a greater responsibility to, to both protect copyrights, but also the YouTubers who can fall foul of its systems. The rights holders would say YouTube is arguably part of the cleverest company in the world. Absolute rubbish! In terms of its ability to create clever technical solutions to things, and indeed, they were a bit of a pioneer with content ID. I mean, goodness sake. Do they even bother to fix these things? It can't be beyond their capabilities to continue to evolve the technology. <laughs> Assuming they can be bothered. For streamers like Jimmy, a solution can't come quickly enough. Absolute joke, the system is. It's an absolute joke. Now, I've been doing YouTube for seven years now, under various, under numerous channels. See, it's an absolute joke. The system is a joke. Anyway, Skull and Bones, that Ubisoft pirate game you'd forgotten about, is getting delayed. <laughs> forgotten about. <laughs> I'd rather the content ID system was forgotten about and never be seen again! <sighs> okay. Pirate Fantasies and Aspiring. Sh Pirate fanciers and aspiring swashbucklers have been busy with Sea of Thieves lately, so it's easy to forget that at E3 2017, Ubisoft unveiled Skull and Bones. Oh, I got a, I got a response. Go back to that article in a couple of minutes. I don't shut up, Call of Duty. Nobody cares about you anymore. Gunbones. Well, yes. So bones. Just as well you've got people like me that cover E3. Because I certainly haven't forgotten about this. I haven't forgotten about it. I just don't talk about it. And you just assume that hey, just because you don't talk about it, it means you're forgetting about the game. Shut up! No, we haven't! It's own take on seafaring shenanigans. Unfortunately, our first update in a while about the project is that it's been delayed until at least 2019. Fine. We'll get more details on it at E3. In its financial report today, Ubisoft said that it has decided to give itself more time to develop Skull & Bones to offer players an even more engaging experience. Skull & Bones is now scheduled for release in 2019-2020. Ubisoft Singapore is the lead studio. Ubisoft Singapore? Wow! That's all that. Is the lead studio on the game, which owes more than a little to the rollicking, rollicking naval battles, rollicking even. Couldn't pronounce it. There. Owes more than a little to the rollicking naval battles that made Assassin's Creed 4 Black Flag such a standout for the series. Today we announced that Skull and Bones will release later than we initially anticipated, says creative director Justin A. Farron. Here in Singapore, this is our biggest game yet. And it is a project filled with immense passion. Many of us have been working on it for the last few years. 
and want to make this game right in order to achieve our ambition to deliver the ultimate pirate game set to thrill players at launch and for years to come. The good news is that some of that hard work will be shown at E3 2018 next month, so we'll get to see what life on the ocean waves really feels like. Our goal remains as clear as ever, to build a shared systematic open ocean that captures the essence of the pirate fantasy and is full of activities. Continues Farron. We aspire to create a game where the act of attacking and robbing ships at sea and where every single decision you make requires you to carefully assess the risk versus reward. It's a game I'm definitely interested in. And while we are on the subject of E3, let's... While we are on the subject of E3... Believe it or not, E3 2018 is almost here! No, duh! The annual gaming extravaganza returns to Los Angeles in June for what is poised to be one of the biggest weeks all year for gaming news. It is the biggest week all year for gaming news! It's the biggest gaming show and tell of the year every year. Much of the news is expected to come from the various press conferences taking place during the week. Microsoft, Bethesda and EA have already announced the date of, and time of their briefings, while Sony has finally confirmed its plans. EA kicks things off on Saturday, June the 9th with its EA Play briefing, while Microsoft and Bethesda will follow on Sunday afternoon and evening respectively. Ubisoft will follow on Monday afternoon with Sony's presentation expected later that evening. Nintendo then keeps things moving with its briefing on the morning on June the 12th. We'll be streaming all of these press conferences live here on GameSpot as well as on Twitter. And I will be reacting to all the conferences. There will be a PC gaming show. There will be a PC gaming show this year as well. And while we hope that indie de publisher Devolver returns this year, because last year's show was bananas. <laughs> Don't need to tell me twice. I was laughing all the way through the entire conference. 15 minutes of madness. That is scheduled for the afternoon of Monday, June the 11th. Woohoo! Below, you can see a rundown of the press conference times and dates that we know about. We will continue to update this post in the days and weeks ahead, leading up to E3. The show itself runs June 12th to 14th, and like last year, it's open to the public. In other news, meanwhile, thousands of miles away, Cyberpunk 2070... Cyberpunk 2077 developer CD Projekt Red has confirmed it that has confirmed it is a wow CD Projekt Red is attending E3 this year. Woohoo! Though this does not necessarily mean that we'll learn more about the upcoming sci-fi game. Still, its presence could be one of the most exciting parts of this year's show. Right. So nothing regarding Oh, so the conferences start on a Saturday this year. Okay. Right. So the press conference schedule, the conf let's say, what's already been confirmed, more or less. Oh, right, are there square readings? Right, let's see. Cyber uh, Devolver Digital scheduled for the afternoon of Monday, June the 11th. Probably in between the PC gaming show and Sony's conference. Right. Here we go. Saturday, June the 9th. EA, 11am Pacific Time, 2pm Eastern Time. So that will be 7 p.m. over here in the UK. Adjust accordingly to your time zone, folks. I'm just giving I'm gonna be giving you the UK times so you know when I go live for these 
reactions. Uh, Sunday, June the 10th. Let's see. 1 p.m. Pacific, 4 p.m. Eastern, 9 p.m. UK time. This is on Sunday, June the 10th. Week after Sheffield. The week after I come back from Sheffield as well. Oh, that's not too bad. Okay. Monday, June the 11th. Let's see. Oh, no, wait, hang on. Thursday, 9.30 p.m. Eastern. So, let's see. 2.30 a.m. First of my late night uh, reactions. Right. Let's see. Monday, June 11th. Square Enix, 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern. So that will be 6 p.m. UK time. Ubisoft, 1 p.m. Pacific, 4 p.m. Eastern, 9 p.m. UK time on June 11th, by the way. Devolver Digital is scheduled for Monday afternoon there. So, so that'll probably be about... The Ubisoft conference is normally about an hour long. So Devolver, probably about 15, 20 minutes on stage. Uh, PC gaming show, 6 p.m. Eastern, which will result in a 1 a.m. start. And Sony, 6 p.m. Pacific, 9 p.m. Eastern, 2 a.m. Oh, wait, 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 wait. Nope. 11 p.m. for the PC gaming show. My mistake. On uh, the Sony, 2 a.m. And then 5 p.m. UK time for Nintendo. Which will be 9 a.m. Pacific, 12 p.m. Eastern. EA, Microsoft, Bethesda, Square Enix, Ubisoft, PC Gaming, so Sony, Nintendo, CD Projekt Red confirming they're going to be at E3, but we don't know what they're going to be doing. And Devolver, hopefully we get another conference as bananas as what we had. Right. Now. No Man's Sky will get cooperative cooperative multiplayer this July. The huge next update is still on 20, whatever it means. Right, ah, here we go. As we already know, No Man's Sky will get a substantial update this July in the form of next. But today, during an Inside Xbox live stream, Hello Games' Sean Murray confirmed that the update will usher in a feature many have been baying for since launch a fully featured cooperative multiplayer. While functionality has already been implemented to allow players to see one another as glowing orbs, but scarcely interact, this update will allow base building collaboration. Base building collaboration. You can team up with friends and you can meet strangers as well. In fact, anything you can do in No Man's Sky appears to be possible with friends, from on foot exploration to deep space aerial combat. Murray didn't mention what a player Murray didn't mention what a player avatar would look like, and nor were any other details about the patch revealed. If it's anything like previous No Man's Sky's patches, there will be more. It's set to roll out on July 24th, which will also mark the game's first release on Xbox One. <clears throat> Upon the release of the last major update last year, Atlas Rising, Chris wrote that while the game has improved, it still lacks magic and mystery. For those still wanting more from the space exploration game, fingers crossed next will prove satisfactory. I've pretty much lost interest in No Man's Sky at this point. Right, let's see. Right. So, Pokemon Go adds a shiny Charizard family. Goody! In honor of the Community Day tomorrow, which I will be taking part in, Pokemon Go's May Community Day is quickly approaching this weekend, with Niantic having already confirmed that the event, confirmed the event to be themed around Charmander, and with it also including a Stardust bonus. 
Now, ahead of the forthcoming event, the game developer has decided to add shiny versions of the aforementioned fire type, as well as its evolutionary family of both Charmeleon and the ALMIGHTY CHARIZARD! <laughs> to the popular mobile augmented reality title service. This much was discovered by prolific Redditor and Pokemon Go fan named CHR Trails. <laughs> Trales, <laughs> I don't even know how you pronounce that. With the Silf Road subreddit community member having shared the photos found below for the fellow Pogo enthusiasts to pursue. The colour changes for the shiny variants of Charmander and Charmeleon don't appear to be too drastic as they both change from the oran their orange hues to a more golden tinted shade, while Char- while THE ALMIGHTY CHARIZARD goes full charcoal black with crimson under its wings. Woo! Crimson red. That I like. Not only will Poke- well, not only will Pokemon Go's forthcoming community this Saturday include increased spawn rates for Charmanders and the potential discovery of the aforementioned Shinies, but also but also would-be trainers can have their Charizard learn the move Blast Burn should they choose to evolve it during the event. Compared to offerings of previous community days, Blast Burn won't be seen as viable as Venusaur's Frenzy Plant, but it does provide a decent alternative to Overheat and Fire Blast. All things considered, the addition of the shiny Charizard family of creatures to the Pokemon Go are simply the latest in Niantic's decision to update the ARG with a slew of shinies this year, as 2018 has seen a fair share of shiny pocket monsters make the cut. Those interested can check out this list of every shiny officially made available. Thus, for, thus far to Pokemon Go. Hopefully the developer will continue this trend well into the future in order to keep fans content. Oh. That I'm definitely looking forward to. But, like I say, I mean, let's put it this way, folks. As far as getting the ALMIGHTY CHARIZARD! Nobody's gonna be trading those when trading becomes available. Please, Niantic, give us trading already, please! Here we go. X. I keep doing this wrong. Microsoft's new Xbox controller is designed entirely for players with disabilities. Is it wrong that I want to try this out? Because I would more than happily try this out. The Xbox Adaptive Controller means more people can play. Here's hoping Sony follows suit. Maybe Nintendo as well? I don't know. Anyway. Video games are a cherished pastime for millions around the world. They stand apart from passive mediums like books and films. Because of their interactivity, even watching someone play a game on Twitch isn't the same thing as playing it yourself. To give more people an opportunity to play those special experiences, specifically players with mobility impairments, that might mobility impairments that might hinder or prevent the use of a standard gamepad, Microsoft has developed the Xbox Adaptive Controller. It's a device designed to pair with an array of existing peripherals to let more people with disabilities play games on Windows 10 and Xbox One. BOOM! It works on PC! It's not just designed to address one specific disability, but instead to be a base of wi on which any number of adaptive options can be added on. Gaming controllers, especially in their current form, can present a significant barrier to entry for many players. A simple fact that able-bodied people often take for granted that it is that two hands and several dexterous fingers are required to use one. As the medium has become more advanced over time, video game controllers have gotten increasingly complicated. As Xbox One control as the Xbox One controller offers 17 distinct button inputs. 17! And that's included! And a pair of analog sticks on top of that! Talking of which, where the 
Boas? Det... Hvad er der? Ah! Jeg ser ikke! Boom! There we go! Jeg ser Here we go! The two triggers! The two bumpers! That's four already! XBAY! That brings it to eight! Nine, ten! Start and back! Nine, ten! Eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen! One, two, three, four. Ah, I'm pressing. And see, there we go. The Xbox, the actual Xbox logo button itself. Fifteen. Let's hang on. Seventeen distinct button inputs. Right. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. Oh, wait a minute. Oh, the sync button, of course. So, the two triggers, the two bumpers, the sync button, that's five. That button there, six. XBAY, ten. Start, eleven. The back button, there, looks like it's the options button. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Right, hang on. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen. Where's number seventeen? Hang on, where's number 17? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. Hang on. I can only count 16 on there. Where's number 17? Oh, control again. Let's see. Let's see if we can get to the bottom of this. Something doesn't add up. I can only count 16 buttons on there, and yet it says 17 distinct button inputs.
course, they've got the. Oh, they'll have the equivalent of what um, R3 would be on the PlayStation controls. That's what it is. But doesn't that turn it? But that doesn't. Doesn't that make it 18? Anyway, the world of video games is not particularly welcoming to individuals with disabilities. <sighs> no need to tell me twice. Game makers and platform holders have made some strides in areas in, in this area in recent years, but for the most part, they've left the hard work to third-party organizations. The Xbox Adaptive Controller is the strongest and clearest expression yet of Microsoft's commitment to reaching people with disabilities, and it sprang in part out and it sprang in part out of and it sprang in part out of a controller that's on the opposite end of the accessibility spectrum. Hmm. Interesting. Well, Right. Well, I am definitely, well, James Rank, you got yourself into this one. He said, he said to me that the, he said that the glorious almighty PC Master Race is the greatest in the world. He told me yesterday, he takes it all back, every single word. Named, shamed and embarrassed, James. <laughs> he has now become a console peasant. <laughs> anyway, let's get back on track. So here we go. These next three articles. Here we go. This is just a rumor, but here we go. Reports that Fallout 3 Anniversary Edition have been leaked and it could be coming to PS4. It's officially E3 season, which means that a tons of rumors, potential leaks and revelations will be flying all over the place over the next couple of weeks. Earlier today, a new rumor regarding the upcoming Nintendo E3 briefing popped up. Apparently revealing that the fact that an, a Fallout 3 Anniversary Edition would be announced during the briefing. At Nintendo's conference?! <laughs> Fallout! Which is done by Bethesda, who have their own conference! Goodness gracious me! And they're going to reveal it at Nintendo's conference? Right, anyway. What else do we have? Oh, three. Normally we wouldn't cover what Nintendo was announcing during E3, but with a game like Fallout 3 being possibly announced, it's not out of the question to think that other console versions of the game would be announced. Ooh. But hang on. If this is talking about Nintendo, why is it talking? Why is he talking about Nintendo if it says it could be coming to PS4? Right. 
Right, it's not out of the question to think that other console. Do, 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 do. It's not out of the question to think that other console versions of the game would be announced. According to the rumor, the game would still be developed by Bethesda, and no other information other than the title has been reported. Of course, this should all be taken with a huge grain of salt, as these things are always long shots to become true. Still, Fallout 3 is nearly 10 years old which is right around when these kinds of iconic games usually get re the re-release treatment. With the, except, with, the except, with the exception of the first Mass Effect game, EA! Either way, we won't have very long to wait as the Nintendo E3 briefing. Briefing is less than a month away. Okay. This makes... This makes... No, this article makes no sense whatsoever because A, it talks about it potentially coming to PS4, but B, it's talking about Nintendo's conference, not Sony's, and this is from a PlayStation site, you idiots! <sighs> GTA 5. GTA 5's hits mammoth number. Also, the sky is blue. It really shouldn't come as much of a surprise when GTA 5 hits another milestone. This is the very definition of the gift that keeps on giving all the game that just will not die. <coughs> According to put. According to publisher Take Two Interactive, during a financial earnings call, GT Grand Theft Auto V sales have reached 95 million units. Meaning, at this point, they could probably buy a few small countries. CSO Strauss Zelnik had this to say to investors Grand Theft Auto V is now in 95 million units. Has now sold. Blah. Grand Theft Auto V has is now sold in 95 million units worldwide, reflecting its status as the highest rating title of the current console generation. Considering it came out at the end of the last console generation on Xbox 360 and PS3, and the must-have game for purchases of PS, PlayStation 4, and Xbox One. The incredible ongoing success of Grand Theft Auto V and Grand Theft Auto Online underscores Rockstar Games' unparalleled skill at producing iconic entertainment experiences that attract and engage new audiences for years after release. He later added during a Q&A, but, but Grand Theft Auto has sold in over 95 million units and according to others apart from us, it's the highest growth and most profitable entertainment product ever made of any sort. Entertainment product, not just game. Entertainment as a whole, books, TV shows, DVDs, films, games, they all fall under the form of entertainment, music as well. You might remember that Grand Theft Auto V was the highest earning digital game of 2017 and we recently talked about how it's the, it's the mo it is the most profitable entertainment product in existence. At this point you don't have to want, at this point you have to wonder when it will stop selling and besides me, who else doesn't own the game? I don't actually have a copy on me at the moment. I know, I know! Put the pitchforks and torches down, internet! Thank you. I will get to the game eventually. I just don't know when. Boom! There we go. Soul Calibur has confirmed another roster addition. After previously adding Tacky, oh goodness sake. Don't 
Stop loading unnecessary junk! Thank you. After previously adding Taki, Bandai Namco has just confirmed the addition of another character to the Soul Calibur 6's playable roster. Enter Yoshimitsu! The Manji Clan Ninja who has been making regular appearances in both of Bandai Namco's most popular fighting game franchises, Tekken and Soul Calibur! In the Japanese version, in the Japanese version, which you can watch at the above trailer, Yoshimitsu is being voiced by legendary voice actor Norio Wakamoto. You can also watch the English version of the version trailer, which has been uploaded to Bandai Namco Entertainment Europe. Here's the English description of Yoshimitsu as quoted from an official tweet from Soul Calibur's Twitter account. Welcome Yoshimitsu back. Welcome Yoshimitsu back to the stage of history. His clan was destroyed by the ire of the of a powerful warlord. As the lone survivor Yoshimitsu dedicated his life to his clan's martial arts with his excellent swordsmanship. He was the greatest swordsman of his time. I made that sound so grandiose. <laughs> anyway, Soul Calibur 6 is slated to have around 20 playable characters based on the slots from the character selection screen seen in games uh, in the game's early demo builds. As of this reveal, 12 playable characters have been revealed. You can check the currently confirmed roster right below. Heishiro Mitsuguri, Sophie Tia, Alexandra, Gro. Nightmare! Yeah! Nightmare! Kilik, Che Zhanghua, Ivy, Zasalamel, Siegfried Stoff, Siegfried Stoffen, um, Stoff, uh, Stoffen, I, I can't pronounce it, I'm sorry! Siegfried Stoffen, St Siegfried Stoffen, okay, Taki Yoshimitsu, and Geralt of Rivia, guest character from The Witcher. The weapon-based fighting game Solar Calibur 6 will be released sometime within 2018 worldwide. Well. Right, let's see. <laughs> now, that's the uh, news out of the way. Now, to get into the last section of the show, and it goes a little something like... Points and trophies, trophy achievement hunting! Points and trophies, trophy achievement hunting! <laughs> So, in honour of State of Decay 2 coming out on uh, Tuesday, unfortunately I won't be playing it on launch day because I'm going to be down in Manchester like I mentioned at the start of the podcast. Uh, so I'm going to be going through the secret achievements of the first State of Decay game. So here we go. War. War never changes. Or does it? <laughs> Survive detonating a nuclear device in Danforth, which is 25 gamer score. This is what the this is what the guide says. Here we go. This is one of the possible endings of the game. Complete the main story and fulfill these requirements. After finishing the hunting missions with Sasquatch, refer to freak hunt achievements. Ooh, freak hunt achievement. Right, hang on. Freak hunt, let's get that up. Free cunt, free cunt, yadda yadda yadda, free cunt, free cunt, da 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 the third, a.k.a. Sasquatch, from the tunnels. He will ask you to kill four special infected monsters in a specific way. 
Each mission will become available after siege as long as he doesn't get killed in the meantime or during such a hunting mission. Take enough meds, snacks and ammo with you because there are usually a lot of regular zombies in the mission areas. Here are the missions. Kill a bloater with a headshot. Pretty easy, especially with focus aim and a good rifle. Kill a feral with an edged weapon. Keep attacking the feral by spamming X so it doesn't jump so that it doesn't jump on you or Sasquatch. Kill a screamer with fire. Use a Molotov. Go dear Molotov! Or firebomb. Or an incendiary shotgun. And last but by no means least, kill a juggernaut. The juggernaut returns with melee weapons. This is the hardest mission. Start by damaging the juggernaut with a car or with a grenade launcher. Only one shot. Only attack him with melee attacks from behind or when he finishes his charge attack. It's important that your health is nearly full, otherwise he'll kill you instantly with one hit. Furthermore, you need enough stamina to dodge his attacks. After completing the missions, take Sasquatch back to base and the achievement will unlock. That sounds fun, I might give that a go. Right, Sasquatch. After finishing the hunting missions with Sasquatch, Sasquatch will go missing. You'll find him in the tunnels where he set up an atomic bomb. Bring him back to base and you'll get the option to talk, talk to him and nuke the town. Now you only have to survive one last siege. This will unlock the achievement and end the game. If you don't want to miss the last voice of Danforth achievement, you should go offline before nuking the town. Xbox settings, network, go offline. Play through the nuke ending offline and after finishing the game, delete the save game from your console, go back online as soon as you launch State of Decay, your previous, and as soon as you launch State of Decay, your previous save game, the one, bef the one before you nuke the town, will be downloaded from the cloud. Soon afterwards, the War Never Changes achievement will unlock, you don't necessarily get a notification. Continue the game and go for the other ending. Go for the other ending now. Alright, the last voice of Danforth achievement. Here we go. Escape Danforth with Vienna Cho in your community. This is one of the possible endings of the game, complete the main story and fulfill these requirements. Vienna Cho is the woman on the radio that keeps telling you about the civilians in trouble. You have to rescue about eight civilians to gain her trust. Sounds easy enough. Then she'll ask you to rescue her as well. As soon as she's in your community, she'll ask you to defuse Sasquatch's bomb. To do this, you'll have to go to the tunnels again. It's pretty dangerous there, so use your best character with plenty of meds, food and ammo. After bringing her back to base, and having completed all main story missions, you'll have the option to evacuate the town and survive the last siege to unlock the achievement. Order a DZ. Got to be out with the gamer score as well. Uh, War never changes. Twenty-five gamer score. Last voice of Dan Forth. Twenty-five gamer score. Order a DZ. Intercept a mysterious supply drop. Twenty gamer score. And letters from Cleo. Intercept five mysterious supply drops. Thirty gamer score. These missions become available when Lily mentions something about a mysterious signal. After a while, there will be a marker on your map and you're asked to investigate the signal. You have to be well prepared before you start because the signal attracts several waves of zombies that you have to defeat. Drive to the location and fully search the supply drop to complete the mission. It's a good idea to take a big vehicle with you, pick up our SUV, to kill most of the zombies with your car. And that's 30 Gamerscope. Whew! Right, and all in all, there are 72 achievements. What?! 72 achievements with a total of 1,500 points. So there we go, folks. That is this week's edition of the Trophy Achievement Podcast. Um, I hope you enjoyed the news updates. If you did, hit the thumbs up. And if you want to be baptized into following this channel, hit the subscribe button down at the bottom. Click the bell to join the latter day scenes notification squad. Turn on all notifications so you don't miss anything I do on this channel. Uh, the finale of Pac-Man World up on the top left and on the top right you've got my dedicated Trophy Achievement Podcast playlist. Tomorrow, Tom and Jerry Sins. I'll be recording those later today. Uh, and uh, then I'll have them uploaded on uh, the Saturday. And then I'll get my music covers recorded for Monday and Tuesday. 
And then from there, I'll see you guys on Wednesday, giving my thoughts on um, uh, my experience down in Manchester for the one-year anniversary of the arena attacks. And then back to business with some bonus videos on Pac-Man World next Thursday. In the meantime, I'll see you guys again soon. Enjoy the rest of your weekend. Have a fantastic day. Peace out. And stay faithful as always.